I'll show this just now. Um, my presentation doesn't have actually anything to do with my thesis, so it's not about visual culture and propaganda today, so I just want to make that clear. Um, so thanks, Bin Bin. Yep, my name is Nicola and I'm um, in my second year at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, conducting some conceptual research into education and propaganda. But what I'm actually going to present today is a hypothetical speculation on what could happen in the future if teaching was to become automated. So I'm going to consider how a robot teacher might function, and that will lead me to consider the relation of Isaac Asimov's three laws of robotics to any hypothetical robot teacher. Um, and by speculating on such a hypothetical future, that might encourage us to critique our conceptualizations of teachers now in the present. Uh, so increasingly and over, certainly over the past year and a half, technology has played such a large part in almost all facets of our lives. In education, we find that our educational spaces are now screens. Students and colleagues are nothing more than apparitions on those screens. Uh, despite this digital migration, there's still a human connection. We know that the teacher on the screen is a representation, albeit a digital one, of a human who is equally interacting with a digital representation of their students. The machine is only a mediator in this case. Trials of robot teachers such as SEA, as you can see on the slide, posit direct interaction with the humanoid machine, but the machine still acts as a mediator for the human as they control her actions and speech remotely. In this presentation, I question whether it would be possible for an autonomous machine to assume the role of teacher by using Asimov's three laws of robotics as a base for predicting the behavior of such robots and whether these could preclude what a teacher must necessarily do in order to teach. After a brief but lofty career as a biochemist, Isaac Asimov decided to quit and become an author full time. He's best known for his science fiction novels and his robot stories. And it was in his short story runaround published in 1942 that he set out a quasi-ethical code known as the Three Laws of Robotics for the intelligent humanoid autonomous robots, which featured heavily in his stories. So these three laws are, <clears throat> one, a robot may not harm a human being or through an action, allow a human being to come to harm. Two, a robot must obey the orders given to it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And three, a robot must protect its own existence, as long as such protection does not conflict with the first two laws. Asimov was surprised that robots were built and put in operation in his lifetime, and that the people building them cited him as their inspiration. When he died in 1992, Robots existed as dumb machines used in factories to do the work that humans could not or would not do. Now we're at the advent of machine learning, smart technologies and quantum artificial intelligence. Academics and engineers over the world are working to make machines increasingly humanoid, increasingly relatable and, like the original meaning of the word robot itself, indistinguishable from the human. So before I can talk in any detail about Asimov's three laws, it's incumbent on me to define the three main concepts involved, teacher, robot, and harm. Uh, arguably, I should also define human being, but for now we can take it as read that any referral to human is made in the biological sense. But in the full version of this paper, which is currently in press, there is a full discussion on the concept of human being, which essentially reaches that same conclusion. So firstly, teacher. Uh, a comprehensive delineation of the concept of teacher would be a thesis long effort, since it would require a thorough investigation of each individual notion of teacher. So for my purposes, I will use a version of the pedagogical triangle, which was introduced to me as a master's student, to show the teacher's position in relation to student and subject matter. From this, we should be able to extrapolate what is essential for teachers there must be a necessary intention to improve a student's relation to content, a necessary application of the teacher's expertise and passion for this purpose, from which we can further infer that a teacher must hold both of these things, 
and the necessary relation between student and educator. Inten intention, passion and relation have notable emotional and human connotations. So I also paraphrase and remodel Carol and Housel's definition of non-human teachers to create the following brief definition. Actor A can be said to teach actor B where its behaviour, whether organic or programmed, denotes an intention to provide B with knowledge and experience, or sets an example for B which results in a change or improved relation between B and the subject matter. To divine, to divine Robot, <clears throat> we might return to Asimov himself, since we will be discussing his laws. He's very clear that a robot is an industrial product built by matter-of-fact engineers for a specific purpose. He writes about his autonomous robots as machines capable of judgment with no human input after the hardwiring of the three laws. Machine ethicist Susan Anderson is a little more explicit when she describes an autonomous machine as one preloaded with ideal ethical principles or some examples of ethical dilemmas with what she calls correct answers. Um, but that is somewhat ambiguous since it would only be based on a universally accepted correctness. It must also have a learning procedure from which it can abstract these so-called ideal ethical principles so that these can be used to guide its own actions. And so briefly put, an autonomous robot is a machine built for a specific purpose, which is guided by ethical principles and judgments, some coded and some learned. The concept of harm is similarly multifaceted and given how it is applied in the three laws to both humans and robots, we need a definition which, which suits both. An initial look to the legal definition which is ill treatment resulting in physical or psychological damage to a person or physical damage to property, proves that it could only be sufficient for both human and machine if the machine were to be considered the property of another person. John Stuart Mill's definition, which states that a harmful action must violate or risk violation of the important interests of others in which they have a right, can only work in cases where a robot has been inferred any legal right. In this case, an assignment of the semantic definition rather than a systematic one works better for both human and machine. And so I paraphrase a definition from the Collins English Dictionary. Harm is a result of hurting someone physically or psychologically or damaging something insofar as it can no longer fulfill its purpose. Now I'll illustrate some scenarios which play out the three laws and speculate on the robot teacher's reaction and how a human may react in each. In this first scenario, the robot teacher is faced with a student who is anxious about a task she's been given. The student is, dis is displaying a number of the common physical symptoms of anxiety, sweaty palms, shallow breathing and fast heart rate and gastric distress. These symptoms are also applicable to numerous physical illnesses and conditions which should receive medical attention. Based on a hard, coding, a hard coding of the first law, the robot must act to avoid this student coming to any harm from the symptoms she's experiencing. It is likely that the robot will remove the student from the situation in the first instance, thereby not allowing her to complete the given task. This is an action which must happen irrespective of whether the robot can identify that the symptoms may be conducive to anxiety or not. And it is indicative of a limitation that the robot has over the human teacher. The ability to weigh risk and sacrifice, as well as a lack of future mindedness. In fact, the pedagogical relation carries a certain level of risk for both the teacher and student. Both must open themselves up to something the student to the introduction of new concepts and ideas, the teacher to the scrutiny of the student as they expose a part of themselves when communicating their passion and expertise for a subject. Teachers make a further gamble by predicting that the benefits to the student in the long term far outweigh the risks taken in the short term. In the scenario here, the human teacher has the benefit of flexible judgment and perhaps empathy. A conversation, some reassurance and support could be all that is required. In the second scenario, 
The robot teacher asks a loud and disruptive student to quieten down so that the rest of the class can work peacefully. The student in all of his youthful belligerence declines and tells the teacher to go away. The robot seeing no conflict with the first law and that it's going away would not cause harm to the student, dutifully retreats to the base destination as coded into its circuitry and can no longer support or influence any of the students for whom it was responsible. This scenario presents us with the question of authority. And this is a concept which runs beyond the idea of teacher as disciplinarian. This law suggests that except in cases where it is instructed to cause or allow harm to come to a human being, the robot has no authority at all. Once again, we find a real shortfall between the notion of the robot teacher and the human teacher. Without authority, what reason would a student have to listen to or take instruction from anyone? Without authority, there cannot exist any trust that the teacher has expertise above that of the student, something which must necessarily be present for improving the student's relation to content. Of course, authority is not inferred onto human teachers automatically, and it is my view that in terms of expertise as a means of gaining authority, it is entirely possible for both humans and machines to hold authority. What the second law precludes is the ability of the robot to exercise it in any meaningful way as the students potentially become aware of the power that they hold over the machine. In this final scenario, which is itself inspired by a scene in Asimov's short story Bicentennial Man, the robot is ordered by the same belligerent student from scenario two to dismantle itself. Given that the second law takes precedence over the third, the robot must obey the human command. A further dilemma ensues if the robot calculates that by dismantling itself, it cannot act to prevent harm to the students in the class. The hierarchical nature of the laws means that now the first law should always take precedence, but an infinite loop is easily created if the student repeats his command ad nauseum, and each of the laws finds itself in conflict with the other two. Any computer programmers among us will know that an infinite loop results in a crash which would render the internal programming and thus the machine itself dysfunctional. This scenario exposes the shortcomings of the laws in general as rigid dogmatic principles governing behaviour. What flexibility could such a system have for dealing with the unpredictable and fluid nature of human interaction? Sure, there are humans and by extension human teachers who also live by what can be perceived a rigid set of rules which seem to lay at their very foundations. I can understand how some people might draw a parallel here, but what is inferred by education itself is there is a capacity for change, and this is at the heart of each relation in the pedagogical triangle. By intending to improve the student's relation to content, the educator is acknowledging a capacity for change in the student which is reflected back in themselves. A robot without a capacity for change would not be able to recognise this in its students. It could be argued that a robot can change if it is programmed to do so, or has been programmed to learn to do so, and that there is only a slight difference between the modification of internal circuitry and education. This is something which would warrant further in-depth discussion. So in summary, given what I've presented here, it's my view that autonomous robots coded with, As with Asimov's three laws could not be considered teachers in any meaningful way. An inability to exercise necessary risk, an inability to trade off present discomfort for future gain, a hardwired lack of authority, and being governed by an inflexible set of laws resistant to change are all to the robot teacher's detriment. This is, of course, my view based on my understanding of the notion of teacher as needing all of the latter to be able to teach effectively. There are others who may take different views. Those who believe that teachers are merely imparters of knowledge or skills can probably see no issue with a machine being responsible for such dispersal. These views are evident in the kind of technology which are being created with this purpose in mind. It could also be argued that a robot need not be coded with the three laws. And indeed, as we find the development of robotics gathering a pace, many academics in that field are working towards a code of meta-ethics, which will offer a little more flexibility than Asimov's. 
The author himself acknowledges that what he had set out in his work of fiction was probably not infallible. Perhaps we as academics in education might consider whether the coding of an ethical system into a machine is any more or any less different than what happens when a person is educated. Furthermore, if we ever did develop a machine which could teach, can we say that there is a, mach that there is a machine that could be a teacher? Is there such a distinction between doing and being? If so, when does a newly trained teacher, instructed with abundance in the doing, make that qualitative leap into being a teacher? These are questions worth asking, otherwise we risk our universities and colleges becoming teacher factories, concerned only with the manufacture of people for a specific educational purpose. And perhaps in this respect, there is not so much difference between human and robot teachers after all. Thank you very much for listening, everyone. I will end screen share.